y con y listo sin mí. Tis dis in mi sicilos en san nimi sastanatu sima polifronio. The Aegean Bronze Age and the Mycenaean Civilization. Part 1 Introduction. For this episode, my exploration of the origin myths of the Aryans will focus once more on the Greeks, the Hellenic prehistory, and especially the Bronze Age at the lands and islands around the Aegean Sea. The title of this series of episodes is to some extent contradictory. Origin myths. The term origin implies more reliable information that can be confirmed by scientific disciplines to a satisfactory degree of certainty, while on the other hand the term myth refers to the totally unscientific but magical world of the immortal folkish traditions, where the collective subconscious of a people, the esoteric depth of the human spirit, and the sacred world of metaphysics give birth to the most beautiful and enlightening storytelling. No other period in the long history of the Aryan race could better fit the description of these two seemingly contradictory terms than the European Bronze Age. The chronology of the Bronze Age is not standard in Europe and has significant geographical variations. One thing, however, remains the same. It is hidden under a veil of mystery, only sporadically penetrated by the sciences of archaeology, linguistics, population genetics, or illuminated by ancient folk traditions that survived in time, giving us just enough evidence to form a credible and relatively conclusive idea about the people and the events of the time, but hardly ever providing a detailed account. The lack of written records, the passing of thousands of years, and all the dramatic events which took place in our continent ever since, makes it an enormous challenge for any science to independently reconstruct and decipher the European Bronze Age. Only a comparative approach of the surviving evidence and a sober and intuitive attitude, unhindered by academic stiffness and immune to political correctness, can make the necessary synthesis and shed light to the most decisive period of the European continent, when the area newcomers transformed Europe into their historical fatherland. In our first episodes, we followed the Aryans from the primordial homeland at the shores of East Siberia down to the Pontic Caspian steppes, where archaeologists locate them around 4500 BC and from where they migrated east and west. It will take at least 2000 more years at the transition from the Neolithic to the Bronze Age for the Aryans to enter the realm of early history when their archaeological and cultural footprint becomes more evident and a reliable reconstruction of our ancestral civilizations can be made. The European Bronze Age was a violent time, defined by the arrival of the Aryans from the steppes north of the Black Sea, who completely reshaped the ethnological landscape and fertilized their new homeland with their spirit, their culture, and their invincible vigor and momentum. The European continent was not uninhabited when the Aryans swept in from the east. Far from that. Stratums of various populations, mainly composed of Neolithic farmers and others, some even with an earlier Aryan genetical component, had thrived and led peaceful lives for thousands of years. Some of them, like the Minoans of Crete, had even created highly sophisticated civilizations. The time of peace, however, was about to reach a sudden end by the chariot riding, well armed and extremely warlike invaders from the east. In parts of Europe, the pre Aryan populations were almost completely replaced 
by the Indo-European newcomers. In Britain, for example, 90% of the Neolithic farmers were gone within 300 years. The study of DNA allow us to see the results of the interactions between the Aryans and the pre-Aryan populations of Europe on the genetical level. Archaeology illuminates to some extent, but what exactly happens remains a mystery. At the lands around the Aegean Sea, however, things are very different. Nowhere else in Europe can we explore and follow the area newcomers of the Bronze Age in such detail and accuracy so long back in time as we can in Greece. Around the middle of the 3rd millennium BC, a vanguard of Aryan tribes entered the Greek peninsula, and for the next thousand years, waves of newcomers with an already distinct ethnological and linguistic profile would migrate south. When these first tribes of the Hellenic branch of the European Aryans entered the southeast tip of our great continent, the veil of mystery was suddenly lifted and a beam of light illuminated the great protagonists of the up until then dark scene of Aryan prehistory. It is the Aryan invasion of Greece that gave us the first detailed accounts of the race who reshaped the anthropological and cultural landscape of Europe and has decisively defined the destiny of our planet ever since. Before we move on, I need to make two necessary clarifications. First, the Bronze Age around the Aegean Sea, dating roughly from 3000 to 1000 BC, was technically not only Hellenic. Our use of the term Hellenic and Greek is exclusively racial, ethnological and cultural, not geographical. It refers to the Hellenic branch of the Indo-European, the tribes who spoke a Greek Indo-European language, worshipped the Greek Indo-European pantheon, whose customs, traditions and blood were of Aryan stock and who were the bearers and originators of the Hellenic nation and civilization. During the Bronze Age, the lands around the Aegean Sea were inhabited by a mosaic of pre-Aryan populations and cultures similar to the rest of Europe, but with a very important difference. The Greek Aryans entered the domains of very ancient and thriving civilizations, when they colonized the Mediterranean shores of Greece. Civilizations who predated them for many centuries and whose footprint is well documented, like the Minoans, the Egyptians and the Hittites. These last three nations, together with their contemporary Assyrians, Babylonians, Mitanni, Canaanites and others at the Levant and the Near and Middle East, formed a complexly interwoven network of trade, cultural exchanges, diplomacy and conflict, dealing with a commodity that gave its name to that very age, bronze. In that older part of the world, the interrelationships between these cultures were complex and well established. Their prosperity and fate were intertwined as they were all dependent on a flow of commerce and goods that reached very far. The metallurgists of Greece were casting bronze by mixing copper coming from Cyprus and tin coming mainly all the way from Afghanistan. This kind of early globalization, as some archaeologists like to call it, will not be seen again on the planet for at least 1500 years and the level of dependency between these civilizations was a major contributing factor to their almost simultaneous and catastrophic collapse at the 12th century BC, known as the Bronze Age Collapse. It is mainly the contact and interaction of the early Greek Aryans with these cultures, and especially with the Minoans of Crete, that put them under the spotlight of history revealed fundamental aspects of their identity and stimulated their inherent will to create, to overcome, to wage war and to conquer, 
when they found themselves in these new and fascinating parts of the planet, in the middle of historical action where great ancient civilizations came together. It is also this interaction that allows us for the first time to see the vast differences between the mentality, spirit and character of the Aryans and the orientally influenced civilizations of the Mediterranean and to observe how the unforgiving laws of nature can lead to degradation and degeneracy when blood mixing occurs. Second, the Aegean Bronze Age is not entirely prehistoric. The transition from the prehistoric age to historical times is defined by the development of writing systems and most importantly the existence of written records. The script known as Linear A, used by the Minoans, dates back from 1800 BC, and the script known as Linear B, the script of the Mycenaean Greeks, dates to the 15th century BC. Linear B is the first script in Europe used to express an Indo-European language and with surviving written documents. It redefines the latest period of the Aegean Bronze Age as early history of the Greek Aryans, represented here by the legendary Mycenaeans, who are the central heroes of today's broadcast. The reason we choose to focus on the Aegean Bronze Age and the early Greeks is the abundance of information available, which allows us to reconstruct the chronology of the unfolding events and the ethnological profile of the protagonists of, the, of those dramatic times quite accurately. Nowhere else in Europe is that possible for those times, and nowhere else in Europe is it more fascinating. Part 2. The Minoans of Crete The dominant and most influential civilization in Greece before the coming of the Aryans was the Minoan, named after legendary King Minos, whose heritage and memory would be irreversibly incorporated into the extensive world of Greek mythology. Their base was the island of Crete and the labyrinthian palace of Knossos. Their domain, the Aegean islands and their sphere of influence covered all the lands and islands around East Mediterranean and of course mainland Greece. The Minoans of Crete built the first advanced civilization of Europe, who fell into oblivion after its collapse at the end of the Bronze Age, with only a vague memory surviving in the Greek myths, and whose remains were unearthed by archaeologists at the beginning of the 20th century. Ever since, the Minoans have been integrated as an undisputable part of early Greek origins in the collective consciousness of the Greek nation, and have been incorporated in the early chronology of Greek history. But the reason for that is mostly geographical. The Minoan civilization was not Aryan. Genetical studies have revealed a small Aryan genetical component of the Minoans, definitely not dominant. But any sober scientific observation of them demonstrates a culture with attitudes, mentality and archaeological footprint almost antithetical to the legacy of the Aryans. The excavation site of Knossos, the central Minoan palace on Crete, has revealed a very long history of human presence dating back to 7000 BC. The palace, however, was constructed for the first time about 2000 BC, indicating a very abrupt change from the Neolithic farming societies who dominated the island until then, and more or less the whole Europe, to a wealthier and more centralized political and religious power, similar to the models we find in the Near East about the same time. The appearance of these complex palatial centers on the island of Crete, about 2000 BC, coincides with a momentous, earth-shaking event taking place in the South Balkans. A new Greek Aryan tribe invades northern Greece and reaches all the way to the south shores. The Achaeans of the Homeric poems and the Hittite and Egyptian records arrive. 
They are related to the Aryans who had established themselves in Greece the past centuries, but they are more advanced as they knew and used bronze, more resilient, more warlike and more adventurous. This wave of Greek Aryans with the Achaeans on the front line will settle and colonize Greece down to the source of the Mediterranean, without however venturing to the islands across the sea. For the moment the sea is an obstacle. They haven't seen it for thousands of years. We know it because we can follow their paths in centuries before. And they have no war for it. They have to borrow one from the ind indigenous peoples, linguistics explains. They are nomads with no seafaring experience. But in the coming centuries, these tribes will give rise to the Mycenaean civilization, who will fertilize Greece with the blood and the spirit of the Aryans and whose legacy will persevere throughout Greek history. The Minoan palace of Knossos is built around 2000 BC. By this time, the Minoans have embraced the sea. The central theme of their art is marine life, and their livelihood is dependent on seafaring and naval trade. The Minoan sea dominance and influence is not restricted in Eastern Mediterranean. They trade with Italy, Spain and Gaul. They venture and find new markets in Britain and the Baltic shores. And with them spreads bronze, the greatest commodity of the time. The Aegean Sea and the southern Greek mainland, where now the Aryans lurk, becomes a kind of Cretan industrial protectorate. In 1750 BC, the palace of Knossos is destroyed burned to the ground. We have no reason to think it was the Mycenaeans. Only Egypt had a fleet big enough to take on the Minoans, but they still had the best relations. And the detailed Egyptian records speak of no conflict or military campaigns to their allies at the north. Some archaeologists believe that the destruction of the palace was a result of devastating earthquakes, not unusual to that part of the world. But the most probable theory is internal fights, civil unrest and revolution. Fifty years later, the palace is built again, much greater than before. And it is the ruins of that palace the tourists visit today. This time, the scale of the construction is breathtaking, unseen before in Europe. A multi-storage complex of 20,000 square meters with an estimated 1,000 chambers, built with exceptional craftsmanship, lavishly decorated with colorful frescoes, equipped with advanced water managing and ventilation systems. The palace and the surrounding city housed the population of 100,000 people in its peak during the 17th century. It is, however, its structure and design that mirrors the mentality and reveals the identity of its builders and occupants. It is not an orderly structure, but complex and maze-like. The harmonious symmetry and geometry of Aryan architecture is nowhere to be found. Rooms are added unorganized, one upon the other, as the palace is extended and renovated in the coming centuries. The Minoan builders are interested in luxury and functionality and their structures are chaotic and complicated. A theory suggests that the palace was built that way to confuse an invading mob, to make it easily defendable by a few experienced soldiers who knew their way around. But this pattern of architectural anarchy is widespread in all the Minoan palaces of Crete and all their cities. The fact is that this aspect of Minoan architecture is an early model and the predecessor of the similarly chaotic urban architecture of the Middle East, predominant to this very day in the large metropolis of Egypt, Syria and Iraq. The labyrinth of Minos in Greek mythology, where the half-man, half-bull, demon, the Minotaur, would hunt and kill its sacrificial victims is an obvious reference to the vastness and maze-like design of the Palace of Knossos, with its multiple rooms, corridors and staircases, 
that must have made such an uncanny impression on the Mycenaeans. Ancient Greek sources, mainly historians Thucydides and Hesiod, speak of the mythological king Minos and his naval rule. The greatest fleet of those times was in his disposal. He fought off the pirates who disturbed his trade and put his brothers Sarpedon and Radamanthes as kings at the Aegean Islands. His reflection in the Greek myths is contradictory. On one hand, the Greeks imagine him as the mighty ruler of a hundred cities, a semi-god, son of Zeus, righteous and moral, who the gods made an afterlife judge in Hades. On the other hand, he was a dark lord and high priest of the snake goddess, whose figurines were found all over Crete. The Minotaur was his abominable adopted son, the offspring of the unholy mating between Minos' wife, Pasiphae, and Poseidon's sacred bull. The latter negative picture is the oldest one, from the time of the Mycenaeans who had actually seen the palace of Knossos and learn to respect the wealth and might of King Minos, before the classical Greeks romanticized and ennobled the old king, and whose story was for them just an echo from the past. King Minos's negative depiction is not only more persistent and frequent in Greek mythology, but also more accurate because it reflects the vast differences between the Minoans and the early Greeks, well documented by archaeology and tradition. Differences that evolved to rivalry and frictions and culminated to total war, as we will see later. It is only the Athenians who kept a distinctive memory of the Minoans in their folk traditions and recollect a time when the naval rule of King Minos had subjugated Athens and parts of mainland Greece. According to legend, among the early kings were Cecrope and Danaos from Egypt, who ruled over Athens and Argos, and the Phoenician Cadmos, who ruled Thebes. This is a historic impossibility that no evidence can support, and a reasonable explanation proposed by science is that those Egyptian and Phoenician kings were subjects of the Minoan Empire foreign despots allocated to rule over spheres of Minoan dominance. The most evident, however, memory of Minoan dominance over Greece is portrayed in the legend of the Athenian central mythological hero, Theseus. King Minos had subjugated Athens and enforced upon them an annual tax of seven young men and seven virgins to be shipped to Crete, enter the labyrinth, and be devoured by the Minotaur. The young prince Theseus volunteered and promised to end this horrendous penalty. With the help of King Minos' daughter, Prince Ariadne, he slayed the Minotaur in his lair and found his way out of the dark labyrinth. He returned to Athens as a liberator and was crowned king. The familiar and archetypical Aryan myth of the young prince who slays the monster kidnaps the foreign princess, liberates his people and becomes a king, is repeated here, with the Minoans as the alien enemy and the oppressor. The Minoans' widespread financial and cultural influence during great, great parts of the Aegean Bronze Age, illustrated in the oldest Greek myths, is confirmed by archaeological evidence. But no traces of military might, conquest or warlike mentality have ever been discovered or can be tra traced to the Minoans. On the contrary, the great palace of Knossos had no walls or defensive structures. It had never been fortified. The Minoans felt safe and unthreatened on their island. They had never been invaded or waged military campaigns. Crete was an epicenter of international trade that somehow succeeded to increase its wealth, maintain its independency, and even expand its influence by a careful balance of diplomacy and supply of very popular goods in high demand from all the great kingdoms of the time. Their geographical position, an island in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, hundreds of kilometers away from the nearest mainland, was advantageous 
and the only nation with a fleet capable of threatening them, the Egyptians, are kept content with profitable trade agreements and luxurious gifts. Murals and wall paintings of the new Egyptian kingdom depict the Minoans bearing goods and offerings to the pharaoh with their characteristic long, dark, curly hair and speak of them as their subordinates, which is not proven by any archaeological evidence and it is probably a result of cunning Minoan diplomacy and the vanity of the pharaohs. The Minoans manufacture and export goods on an industrial scale, among them the best and most popular weapons of their time, but not for internal use. The Pax Minoica, the Minoan peace, lasts for at least 700 years, and the Minoans seem to have forgotten even the meaning of war, a crucial mistake which the laws of history never forgive. The palace of Knossos is richly decorated and from those wall frescoes and the artifacts discovered we can create an accurate picture of that culture. Their art depicts peaceful scenes of religious celebrations, processions and sacred rituals like bull leaping, realistic themes like gardens and flowers and compositions of their beloved marine life. My known men are depicted dark, short and slender. The women are light and elegant. The few times armed individuals are portrayed, if we can call them soldiers, they are lightly armed and almost never bear a helmet or an armor. They carry small round shields, a sword spear, a dagger and use a bow. These themes, however, are not of militaristic nature, but rather indicate a ceremonial use of weaponry as well as for sport, hunt and leisure. Keep in mind that this civilization was probably the greatest weapon producers of the time. The weapon makers of Crete built all kinds of arms in every size for every taste, even long and heavy blades for the Mycenaeans, all for the purpose of export. In the face of the heavily armed Greeks, however, their weaponry changed and during the last century of their independence they also bear helmets and bronze armors. They too started using long and heavy swords, but it was too little, too late. The Minoan religion remains a mystery. The lack of written records makes it hard to create a detailed picture, but reliable conclusions can be made by studying their art and architecture. The character of their religious beliefs is similar to the pre-Aryan populations of Europe and to the civilizations of the Near East, as so much else with the Minoans. The central deity is the mother goddess, the bare-breasted snake mistress whose numerous figurines found in Crete resemble a refined development of the Neolithic mother goddess with the exaggerated breasts and hips found all over Europe before the arrival of the Aryans. The Lady of the Serpents is associated with the bull and the lion and often escorted by a younger male consort, a prince or a husband. The bullhorns and the double-headed axe play a significant religious and political role, and the trademark spork of the Minoans, bull leaping, seems to have ritual significance as well. The only name of a Minoan goddess that has ever been identified is that of Ariadne, the legendary daughter of King Minos. The Mycenaeans, in their Linear B records, called her Mistress of the Labyrinth, indicating the Mycenaean origin of the old myth of Theseus and, most importantly, their belief of a labyrinth somewhere in Crete. Evidence of ritualistic human sacrifice has also been discovered in Minoan excavation sites. The findings of Minoan iconography are plenty and well preserved, but no image can with certainty be attributed to a king or a god. King Minos is nowhere to be seen. The most important aspect, however, of Minoan art is the dominance of females in their iconography. 
female symbolism is present in almost every depiction. Goddesses, priestesses, sacred virgins, women in sports, leisure and everyday life. This is a matriarchal culture. Matriarchy doesn't necessarily mean that women occupy the highest positions of political, religious and social hierarchy. It implies primarily that female attributes of fertility, childbirth and sacred love dominate the metaphysical conceptions and the religious rites, where women are incarnations of a timeless, primordial and universal, life-bearing and life-giving force, symbolized in religious terms by the earth or mother goddess. It is the established worldview and religious attitude of all cultures with origins to the pre-Aryan Neolithic farming populations. In traditional Indo-European metaphysics, life originates from a universal masculine principle which contains the idea, the model of creation and the will to create. A form giving absolute center symbolized by the Sky Father which shapes the passive female principle into the countless and transient forms and variations of the manifested world. Women in Crete have an elevated position, play a major role in religious rites and dominate my known religiosity. Some scholars claim that they have identified a female solar deity and a mountain goddess worship at peak sanctuaries. But the evidence is vague and disputable. The Minoan religion seems to be a chthonic cult of mysticism under the spell of the snake mistress and with a demonic sacred bull in the epicenter, resembling the religions of their Semitic neighbors in the Near East. The language of the Minoans is unknown. They use the writing system composed of a script called Linear A, an ideographic syllabic script which developed independently from the Egyptian hieroglyphics and the language systems of the East, despite persistent attempts by linguistic experts for the past hundred years it has not yet been deciphered. No Rosetta Stone has been discovered to guide the scholars and no language family can claim, beyond any doubt, affinity to this extinct tongue. Between the 18th and the 14th century BC, King Minos reaches his prime and the Minoans their greatest dominance. Part 3. The Mycenaeans By that time, however, a lot has changed in mainland Greece. The Aryan tribes of the Middle Bronze Age, with Achaeans on the front line, have already established themselves in their new homeland. They dominate over the indigenous people and earlier Hellenic tribes and occupy strategic strongholds from where they control the surrounding areas. The most famous settlement is the legendary city of Mycenae in southwest Peloponnese, which gave the name to this legendary Aryan civilization of the European Bronze Age. The palace of Mycenae is raised upon the highest hill, the Acropolis. But the Mycenaeans are not building Babylonian, illustrious and maze-like palaces. They are building fortresses. This bastion is the seat of the legendary king Agamemnon who led the Greeks in the Trojan War, but it's not the only one. The palaces of the Achaean kings are plenty and despite their wealth and luxury, they are essentially castles where the civilian pe peasants can find refuge in case of war. Fortified by gigantic monumental stone walls called Cyclopeans, a name given by the Greeks of the classical period a thousand years later, 
who believed that only mythical giants, the Cyclops, could have built such megalithic structures. The boulders of the walls are unworked and roughly fitted together. They weight up to a hundred tons each, and these impressive fortifications bear many technical refinements familiar to us as standard European defensive fortification, with galleries, cisterns and projecting bastions for the protections of gateways, an early model of the mighty medieval castle walls of Europe. The central gateway at the walls of the heavily fortified citadel of Mycenae is the legendary Lion Gate, still standing today as a landmark and a reminder of Aryan glory. Above the main entrance leading to the Citadel Central Avenue stands this very first example of emblematic monumental sculpture in Europe. It consists of two natural-sized robust stone lions standing on their back feet, facing symmetrically towards a central pillar. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? Two mighty lions standing on their back feet facing each other. It has been the most widely used coat of arms ever since in the Aryan world. The most popular war banner decorating military flags and standards of all the great Aryan nations throughout history. The most recognizable and emblematic symbol of Aryan might, of noble military spirit, and the most renounced emblem of Aryan aristocracy. There it is, for the first time, 3,500 years ago a timeless token of the greatest adventure of the Aryans, the conquest of Europe. The lions rest their front legs upon the base of a pillar standing in between them, which is the focal point of the sculpture. Many theories have been presented about the meaning of this pillar, and remember, the Mycenaean civilization has been, and still is, a field of academic scrutiny by countless experts in the past 100 years and this pillar has seen many different interpretations. It is thought to be a religious symbol, or a symbol of the Mycenaean state. It can be both, as for our ancestors, religious and political power were inseparable. The great Achaean kings of the Bronze Age were also the high priests. I dare to put forth my personal theory. I cannot help to see in it the sacred pillar of Aryan spirituality, an early Irminsu, the vertical pillar connecting the world of man to the kingdom of the gods, the axis of the world, the epicenter of creation and the point of balance between the human and the divine, the ephemeral and the eternal. Probably the most important symbol of Aryan spirituality, sometimes depicted as a tree or as a standing monolith, but most often as a single column in countless examples in Aryan history. The city of Mycenae is the capital and the major stronghold of the Mycenaean civilization. The site has been thoroughly excavated and studied. The structure is orderly and well organized. The center of the palace was not an oriental courtyard like in Knossos, but an impressive rectangular hall used for court functions and social and religious events, the Megaron, residence of the king and worshipping place of the gods. The additional chambers are square, and the layout is very geometrical, indicating a very well-planned construction never seen before in Greece. The Megaron is a predecessor of Hellenic, Aryan, monumental architecture and an early model of the classical Greek temple, like the Parthenon we described in our previous episode. The front side is aligned with a colonnade, a line of columns, and the building bears the characteristic double sloping roof the Aryans brought with them from the north, the roof that allows for the snow to fall off. It has also no windows to keep the cold out, inappropriate for warmer climates, but the memory of the cold winters in the north is still vivid and their adaptation to the milder Mediterranean climate is yet not complete. Inside the citadel we find all the local industries and the metallurgists who work the famous Mycenaean gold. Barricades and soldier chambers exist in plenty. 
Another distinctive feature of the palace, the Megaron, is the hearth, the central fire pit under an opening in the roof, the hestia of the Greeks and Romans, so essential to all Aryan architecture, the central point of residences, palaces and temples alike, where the sacred fire must always be kept ablaze. Nothing like this exists in King Minos' palace in Crete. The palaces are richly decorated with impressive frescoes. It seems that the Mycenaeans have fully embraced the artistic style of the Minoans, but the choice of themes, the content, is very different. Mycenaean iconography in wall paintings, pottery or jewelry is not dominated by flowers, gardens or women. On the contrary, their favorite and most frequent themes are battle scenes, military campaigns and marching warriors, duels and hunts of wild beasts, chariots and horses, weapons and arms. This is a warlike people who venerate the heroic ideal and glorify bravery and manliness, a society ruled by an aristocratic warrior elite, keen in battle and expansion, and that shows in their art. Another major and very revealing aspect of Mycenaean art is their love for visual harmony. Their decorations are geometrical and symmetrical. There is balance, order and simplicity, unlike the Minoan art which is random, unstructured and superfluous. Mycenaean art carries already the first seeds of the Greeks' love for ethnicity and harmony which will later become the trademark of classical Aryan aesthetics and the foundation of their philosophical concepts. The greatest bounty, however, of information regarding the Mycenaean civilization comes from the excavations of their burial places. In the early period, up to 1500 BC, the dead were buried in shaft and uh, cyst graves, very common in Europe during the Bronze Age. Fortunately, many of these subterranean graves survived the test of time and escaped grave looters. And thanks to the vision and the persistent efforts of legendary German archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann, whose passion for Homer and the Hellenic mythical world led him to the discovery of both Troy and Mycenae, these graves saw the light of day again in the 19th century. Only in the citadel of Mycenae, Schliemann discovered 32 schist and shaft graves in cemeteries called Grave Circles A and B, many of them untouched. The treasures unearthed were unimaginable and gave all credit to Homer, who spoke of Mycenae as the Golden City. The finest examples of Mycenaean art and craftsmanship lied in those graves, escorting the prominent aristocracy to its final resting ground. The dead are laid to rest in gold masks and funerary armor, the women in gold crowns and clothes, gleaming with golden ornaments. Beside them we find rich gifts and precious artifacts, golden jewels, vessels and vases in gold and silver, bronze swords with gold and ivory shafts, daggers with silver and gold engravements depicting wild hunts and battle scenes royal sceptres and full sets of weapons, vases made of crystal and the spectacular funeral masks placed upon the face of the dead. One of them was made of amber coming from the Baltic, but most of them are of pure gold. The finest and most impressive of them, Schliemann called it the mask of Agamemnon, the legendary king of Mycenae who led the Greeks in the campaign to Troy the only artifact of the Aryan Bronze Age whose archaeological value and cultural importance could be compared to that of Agamemnon's golden mask is the legendary sun chariot, the Sulvand, from Denmark, which we have described in detail in a previous episode. The golden mask of Agamemnon is the most exquisite and magnificent artifact of the European Bronze Age a product of superior Aryan craftsmanship with a spiritual importance that we can only speculate about. The truth is that the Golden Mask predated the Trojan War and King Agamemnon about 300 years. But I can understand Heinrich Schliemann's excitement 
as he brought the world described by Homer into physical, tangible reality. These graves were reserved for the warrior elite, the royal families and the aristocrats. In contrast to pharaoh graves of the Egyptian royal dynasties of those times or other Bronze Age burial sites of the Mediterranean and the Near East, the graves of the Achaean aristocracy were graves of warriors and heroes, indicating that the hero cult was primordial and a fundamental aspect of the Aryan worldview which they always carried with them as long back in time as the archaeologists can trace them. The most imposing graves, however, are the ones of the latest period, from the 14th and 13th century BC. The monumental Mycenaean chamber tombs, or dome graves, named by the gigantic oval dome that comprises the roof. They are subterranean, cut from the rock in existing hills, and remind us of the Kurgan graves, those iconic old Aryan graves where a mound of earth like a hill is raised around and above the grave chamber. The Kurgan graves left behind by the Aryans during the migrations and whose characteristic silhouette stands out in the horizon and allow us to geographically follow them wherever they have been. The greatest of these dome graves is a treasury of Atreus father of King Agamemnon. This is a truly cyclopean monument, a megalithic structure unseen before in Europe and probably the most impressive monument surviving from the, the Mycenaean period. It still stands today almost intact, defying the test of time and human brutality. The dome stands 14 meter tall and 15 meter across. It has been the highest and widest dome in the world for more than a thousand years until the Romans built the Pantheon with concrete. Over the grave's monumental gate we find a relieving triangle, a triangular empty space used to distribute the weight of the dome to the sides and protect the gate from collapsing. The enormous monolithic linter of the doorway that is, the great stone that composes the upper part of the gate and the lower side of the triangle, weights 120 tons and it is still today the biggest in the world. The tomb chamber was lavishly decorated with pillars of green limestone, red marble and green alabastro. The inner walls were polished and decorated in gold, silver and bronze, a spectacle of color and beauty which we can only partially reconstruct. The king buried in it was the ruler of a vast area, from northern to southern Greece, Crete, Cyprus and the source of Minor Asia, with colonies in Italy, Spain and Palestine. These splendid monuments were made to impress and visible as they were, they didn't escape looting, which probably took place within a few hundred years after they were built, possibly by the same barbarians who sacked Mycenae. We can only imagine the number of precious artifacts and the sheer amount of wealth the looters came across. But nevertheless, these monuments will forever attest the might, the glory and the accomplishments of the Mycenaeans. The genius and scale of Mycenaean engineering was not confined to building fortresses, defensive walls and monumental graves. They engaged in complicated terraforming and infrastructure projects of massive scale, never seen before in Europe. They built dams, megalithic bridges that still stand today, and a network of roads to allow for the fast deployment of troops, of quality and magnitude surpassed only by the Romans. I think, however, that their greatest engineering accomplishment was one of a more peaceful character the draining of Lake Copaid. This was a pharaonic project which the Mycenaeans pulled through not by using thousands of slaves but with engineering innovations, intelligence and perseverance. They managed to reclaim about 200 square kilometers of rich farming land by constructing a complex and extensive network of aggregation trenches, draining channels and earth barriers that redirected two major rivers into natural sinkholes and then all the way to the sea, using precise geodetical calculations. 
This project doesn't sound much today, but for those times, and for the warlike semi-barbarian Aryan tribes of Greece, who only a few hundred years before were herding cattle, it was massive. The project required continuous overview and maintenance by officials and workers, and thus it didn't survive the fall of Mycenae, and the lands were flooded again in the 10th century BC. Similar attempts to reclaim the farming land were done by the Greeks of the historical period, but were unsuccessful, and only in modern times was the lake drained again, and the ruins of this monumental Mycenaean terraforming endeavor were revealed to the astonished eyes of 19th century engineers. The history of the Mycenaean world can be reconstructed not only by archaeological evidence, but also by the text of their own script, Linear B, and by the records of other major cultures of Bronze Age, like the Hittites and the Egyptians, who interacted with them. Vague images of that world survived in the Homeric poems as well, where some traits can be considered historical reality, but with uncertainty, of course, as they lie inside the fog of a long oral poetic tradition. The Mycenaeans composed their own script, known as Linear B, inspired by the Minoans. They did not, however, appropriate the Minoan language. They didn't speak the same language. The Mycenaean script was a collection of syllabic signs and ideograms used to express their own Indo-European language, Early Greek. In contrast to the Minoan script, which still puzzles the experts and has not been deciphered, the Mycenaean Linear B was decrypted in the 1950s by legendary amateur linguist Michael Ventris and John Chadwick, a professor of ancient Greek philology. Linear B is composed of 87 syllabic and 100 ideographic signs, inscribed mainly on clay tables which were then baked. The signs of Linear B have nothing to do with the Greek alphabet but will only appear 700 years later, and I will not go into details about how it was decoded, but the ingenious idea that Michael Ventris had was to dare presuppose that the language is actually Greek. It is exactly the kind of inspiration, the kind of epiphany that leads to major breakthroughs in science. She was right. The code was cracked, and Ventris recognized in this enigmatic script Greek words, Greek cities, Greek names, exactly as we find them 700 years later in the Homeric poems. This is the first time an Indo-European language is expressed in written form in Europe. The earliest form of Greek, predating even the Greek alphabet itself. A priceless treasure of information about the Mycenaeans and the Aegean Bronze Age was suddenly available, and that veil of mystery covering the European Bronze Age was suddenly lifted. The Mycenaeans used the script mainly for administrative purposes, to keep record of the palace economy, like a financial and administrative inventory. No poems, no stories and no myths can be read in it. But nevertheless, it was plenty to allow scientists to reconstruct important aspects of their civilization. One of these aspects was the structure of the Mycenaean society. It comprised of a king, the Anax, who sits on the top of both political, religious and judicial authority. Under him was the Lavagetas, the leader of the people, whose duties seemed to be religious and ceremonial. There was a warrior caste, the Hecate, the Companions, the military aristocracy and the highest caste of nobles with hereditary rights. Under them was the Damo, the people, craftsmen, farmers and merchants. In the bottom of the social ladder we find the Doero, the slaves and the serfs. The language gives us the titles of a series of local administrative officials with uncertain roles but also the Kerosia, the Council of the Elders, as well as a cast of priests and priestesses of particular divinities. Regardless of variations and the uncertainty about the role and duties of some of these officials, 
the basic structure of the Aryan social order is already there. And for the first time in history, with the help of this peculiar script that expressed an early Indo-European language, we can confirm the very familiar and typical social division and hierarchy of Aryan societies. There is a king and high priest ca caste, the warrior caste, the commoners and the slaves. It seems, however, that the priest caste is not distinctive in the Mycenaean society as it was in the Indo-Aryans, for example. The king is the high priest, the ultimate religious leader, assisted by officials and ceremonial duties, indicating that the Mycenaeans had preserved the most ancient and authentic configuration of the Aryan social structure, where a distinctive caste of priests, which was a later phenomenon, did not yet exist.